Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, good evening. Welcome to Buddhism as a lived experience monthly lecture series uh, with Dr. Lancaster, Louis Lancaster, jointly organized by Department of Religious Study and Religious Graduate Council, sponsored by Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism. And I'm Miro Sake, Chair of the Department of Religious Study. Uh, today, it is a great honor to welcome and introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Louis Lancaster. Dr. Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asian. And uh, University of West. Seven months ago, we began Dr. Lancaster multi lecture series, Buddhism as a Live Experience. And is in these seven months, Dr. Lancaster has been souring us with his wisdom and compassion. And we cannot thank him enough for his work and dedication. So today, Professor Lancaster is going to talk about another very interesting uh, topic, wisdom, self-knowledge transform. In this talk, Dr. Lancaster will explain what wisdom means according to Buddhism based on his experience and observation. Without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Maroz. It's and to all of you, welcome back to another one of these lectures. Um, I appreciate your willingness to to join us from far and wide. It's a pleasure to be with you. Tonight, I, I would like to talk to you about wisdom. And uh, at the end, as usual, we'll take uh, questions. Uh, the strongest warning in Buddhist texts is about wisdom. Uh, the justly famous statement that uh, wisdom is like a poisonous snake, if held the wrong way, it can bite and kill, gives a view of the teaching that is surprising. How can wisdom, one of the highest states of development, ever become so toxic that it can destroy us. And for me today, the important and crucial question is, can I give a lecture about wisdom and not fall prey to this dangerous aspect of it? And how can you, listening to the lecture, not take a wrong turn so we're, we're in this together, trying to find our own way to best deal with wisdom. At the heart of the Buddhist teaching is the goal of knowing things as they really are. This is one definition of the word Dharma used to describe the message of the Buddha. It is the wisdom of knowing. So how do we go about this knowing, this wisdom? Well, we wish there was some way to get to this level of knowing with ease. A favorite story from childhood is about a wicked queen who had an enchanted mirror that could answer any question the queen who prized her own beauty made a mistake one day and asked the enchanted mirror, who is the fairest of them all? She was shocked and dismayed when the answer came back, not you. That is one drawback to having something that can tell us exactly the way things are. We may not want to hear it. A member of my family uh, devised a test 
of mental agility and found out it could give an early indication of infection from COVID. He asked if I wanted to acquire the app and do a quick check to see if I was infected. My answer was, no, I don't want to know if there's nothing I can do to stop it. The knowledge would get to me soon enough. So am, am I brave enough to receive the information about the way things are? If I had an enchanted mirror in front of me, what question would I dare ask it? Well, I, I do feel that I have an enchanted screen, my phone. It's linked to the internet, which contains nearly 50 zettabytes of data. To put that in perspective, if all that data were put on former technology of high density CD-ROMs and lined up, they would create 275 circles around the earth. So I can ask my enchanted screen, what is the temperature at this moment in Antarctica? It's minus 59, I just checked. The plane carrying my nephew from Los Angeles to New York is now over which state? Nebraska. Where am I? What address? Show me a picture. Where was my great, great, great grandmother born in England? Gloucester. What are the chances of rain in the next five days? Zero. No sage in the past could have had answers that are easily available to me right now. These are are very safe questions. And I'm able to accept the answers of all these questions without fear. But with all this information, I am not told how things really are with my life and the people in it. In fact, having so much information can distract me keep me from thinking about the issues that cause me to fear. In one way, my enchanted screen not only fails to give me wisdom, it takes me farther and farther away from it. The Buddhist texts tell us that the way things really are is the insight that they are empty. We mistake the nature or reality of objects and images. So we think that our experience of something is identical to that something. But mistaking the reality can, can have significant results. It's a bit like driving in a large city without a map or GPS. If we take a wrong turn, driving more and more doesn't get us to our destination. In fact, the faster and longer we drive, the farther we are from it. So if we mistake the true nature of an experience the more we try to understand and experience within that mistaken framework, the farther away we are from the reality. I think of the past it, by which people understood the nature of the earth in relationship to the sun. When they took a wrong turn and mistakenly put the earth as the center, no matter how complex a system of thought they could construct, it never explained observed phenomena. 
it took a brave person to say, you know, the sun is the center of our system and the earth is circling it. Now, of course, <clears throat> since then, we have continued to see wider and wider perspectives. And it turns out that our solar system, as crucial and important as it is to us, is not the center of the universe. We're, we're trying to adjust to the reality that our solar system is just a tiny speck in a giant swirling mass of billions of suns. We're still searching for the way things really are in terms of our universe. And most probably an endless array of multiverses. Almost every time we have an idea, aha, now I know. My knowing turns out to be elusive and it soon evaporates in the face of new information. Yes, I have 50 zettabytes of data. But if I mistake the nature of that data, I run the risk of being misled and becoming more ignorant, not wiser. Isn't it ironic that sometimes the more information, the less true insight in the, the nature of our world of experience? The internet is now seen as a major source of misinformation. Billions of words and data are dominant in our lives. But we're not sure about the ethical dimensions and critical judgments of those words. If we think that wisdom is a fixed state that we can achieve and hold on to for the rest of our life, the dangerous side of it comes into being. <clears throat> a friend wrote to ask me how my lecture preparation was coming along. And I replied that I was wrestling with wisdom. He sent back an amused smile. Thinking about what it would be like to wrestle with something that is potentially a part of myself. I have an image of being alone in a, an arena, desperately trying to find something to hold on to so I can wrestle. It's never there. The frantic grasping just goes on and on because I've taken a wrong turn. And I think there's something lasting, firm and unchanging with which I can grapple. The teaching reminds me that wisdom is an ever changing <laughs> Cái túi này mình phải để gọn vào này, không là lá thì mọi người tưởng đá không? Directed at another momentary event. Trying to hold on to it as is, is as impossible as grabbing a bolt of lightning and keeping it for a prolonged period. The lightning bolt that I try to grasp has already disappeared before I even have the thought of capturing it. So no matter how long and I search and hard I search for that bolt of energy, it cannot be found in this moment or the next moment. My attempt uh, is like a monkey who is trapped because it's put its hand into a trap to grasp an orange. In the act of grasping, the fist of the monk, of course, is too large to pull out of the trap. Yet the monkey won't let go of the orange and is caught. I think of all the oranges I'm grasping. 
old hurts and angers, unwillingness to move on and lose my reward of being a martyr, judgment of others' actions, denial of things that frighten me, not wanting to experience what has been unexperienced, hidden from my consciousness in my life, seeking for safety when a courageous act is needed, living in fear of knowing things as they really are. I hold on to the orange, the hope that I could just, if I could just find wisdom, control it, glory in having it, have the pride of accomplishing such an acquisition. But if wisdom is like a momentary flash, then in order to experience it, <clears throat> I must move closer and closer to the moment. I think it's safe to say there's, there's nothing more meaningless dangerous than my old wisdom, my past wisdom. When my children were growing up, I always felt that they were two steps ahead of my parenting skills. When I had finally perfected how to deal with a 14-month-old, my child was already a 15-month-old with different needs and different behavior. It was not productive to use my knowledge of the younger age to deal with the current age. Living in the moment, easy to say, easy to say, but actually doing it is quite another thing. In the past, a fellow scholar in my life was someone who troubled me and caused me to be rejecting. Opinionated, arrogant, egotistical were just some of the thoughts that raised, raced in my mind when we were together. And then one day at a conference, he came up to me and was subdued. And, and I felt that he needed to say something. It was a big something. His father had died that day. A father who had him tested or aptitude as a young child. And finding that he only had normal ability in the field of his father, he was no longer of much interest to his parent. From then on, he was seen as deficient, even retarded, and was treated with disdain. In that moment, my view of him was transformed. I loved him for what he had become, a leader in his own field. Overcoming cruel rejection, he had made himself into a productive contributor. I fully understood the arrogance, the egotism, the demand for recognition. This was a lesson for me to learn, to know things as they really are is essential. Not just knowing universal and cosmic things, but the reality of that very moment in the case of my colleague, when I came to have a new understanding of him Wisdom is tied to all the fleeting encounters we have every day. It takes focus to keep in mind what I know and what I don't know 
about the interactions that mark daily life. Well, let me describe the act of grasping in another way. When we stream a movie, sometimes and often at crucial moments, it freezes. And I'm left with a screenshot. It upsets me because the screenshot, <clears throat> while a part of the narrative of the film, does not tell me what's going to happen next. There's no further information to be gotten from staring at the frozen image. But in a way, that's what I want from wisdom. I want to become wise and then freeze the screen and be forever wise. But however, like the frozen screenshot, that moment when I was fully aware of the way things are with my scholar colleague was something for that moment. Now, he was still arrogant and egotistical. And while I had a different framework for viewing and experiencing these acts, it required me to be aware of each moment in his presence. Well, let me reassure you, life doesn't stop. It doesn't freeze into immobility and stay put for a long period. I may try to hold on to my orange of a special moment of insight, but the attempt to grasp and keep it fails. My conclusion is that wisdom has to be like life. It has to stream with every new moment. As I said, knowing things as they really are is complex, demanding, ever-changing. Much energy has to be given to reminding myself to let go of the current orange, give myself the freedom to move forward toward that wonder-filled moment of the future. So we don't, we don't have to worry that life can be frozen. It moves in every moment and without any obstruction. I just need to be ready to go along on the ride to be more aware of the passing moments that make up experience. So I think I, I can write back to my friend that I'm hoping for the moment when I can stop wrestling with wisdom and just be at one with the flow of life's experience. I love the words of our young poet laureate at the recent inauguration when she said, if you can't see the light, then be it. If I can't capture wisdom, can't wrestle with it, can't freeze frame it, then perhaps there's a chance for once in a while we, I, can be it. As I prepared this talk, I was at the same time teaching a course at the University of the West, dealing with the primary text of the perfection of wisdom. And th in this text, I pointed out a passage where the disciple of the Buddha, Shariputra, expresses his understanding of achieving high states of spiritual development. Now in that text, Shariputra is not always wise and often expresses a common mistaken notion of the teaching. After hearing about the bodhisattvas who achieved <clears throat> 
insight and wisdom, he remarks, we know how hard it is for a bodhisattva, how hard it is for anyone to attain a high state of wisdom. Just look around, he said. How many important enlightened ones do we see? Very few. That, said Shariputra, is proof that it's a difficult task and one that most cannot master. Well, to his surprise, he is informed. The Buddha does not teach something that is hard to understand. What he speaks to us is easy to realize. As I read over my talk for tonight, I realized that I had done it in the spirit of Shariputra. I've described to you something that is difficult, hard to achieve, hard to hold on to. And I thought, should I discard all that I've written? My colleague was still arrogant and egotistical, but I, I had a different framework for viewing and experiencing his acts. As I thought back to that event with my colleague, I realized that at the moment, I understood his situation with no effort at all. I changed my view. I felt compassion and appreciation. It was completely easy, easy, it was easy. This has reminded me of the experience of being a grandfather and how much easier it is than being a parent. Part of the difference is that I am content to just watch whatever my grandchildren are doing without wanting them to move quickly on to the next stage. Now, during the isolation of the pandemic, I've only had contact at a distance with my neighbor's five-year-old. He watches me every day, watches for me every day to take my daily walk and he usually shouts out to greet me. For me, it's a pleasure to cause and interact with him. Two days ago, he had a lot to say. And his mother finally said, now that's enough, don't bother Lou. And he replied, but I haven't finished talking. I told him I hadn't finished listening either. It reminds me of how young birds climb onto the rim of their nest. They flap their little down covered wings, gaining strength for the time when they will fly. There's no one saying to them, stop that silly flapping and just sit in the nest. They're practicing, just as my neighbor boy is practicing talking. With my granddaughters, I know I won't be here to see their full story. I'm only given the opportunity to see them practice for it. And it's easy, it's easy and delightful to watch. So I've, I've left in this talk a description of my process in trying to prepare it. You have a bit of the story of my attempt to wrestle wisdom to the mat. My wish to have something substantial to say and hold on to. 
my fear of not meeting ex meeting expectations from myself and from you. As you heard, I turned to the text and found guidance. I had to be reminded that insight and compassion can be immediate and easy. If I can just let go of the oranges of my search for something to wrestle, seeing the young birds suddenly soar from the nest into the air, taking flight with ease, it's probably all I need to remember about wisdom. When the right conditions are in place, wisdom and compassion arise without barriers. This wisdom is not dangerous, not toxic, not even difficult. It is for sure nothing that I need to Russell. Thank you very much. We'll stop and take some questions. Thank you, Lou, for a wonderful lectures. Wisdom is a very important topic in the Buddhism, and it's one of the very difficult and to understand. Uh, so now we're going to begin our question session. So if you have any question, you can type in in the chat box, I will put forward this uh, your question to Dr. Lu. Uh, so I'll begin with my question first. So it seems like the when we study the Mahayana Buddhism, uh, the wisdom, the emphasis on the wisdom from Nagarjuna to Chandrakirti is very it changes. Right in Nagarjuna, they put too much emphasis on the wisdom aspect. And when we uh, read Santideva or Chandrakirti, uh, so both of them, they put emphasis on compassion as well as wisdom. Uh, so what is your take on that shift? Well, <clears throat> if I go back to my experience with my colleague, when, when I really had insight about why he was the way he is. Without any barrier, I had compassion for him. I think we all would. How can you not have it? Somebody who is mistreated, somebody who has been, his life has been under such stress from the very person who should have been his greatest defender and supporter. So insight is followed by compassion if it's real insight. And it happens easily. You don't have to make yourself be compassionate if you have an insight into the way things really are. If you really know another person's situation. All of us have stories of anxiety, of troubles, worries, frets. We all have them. We have fears. And if we know them, how can you not feel loving wisdom? Thank you. There's a lot of question now. Uh, we have, uh, Dr. Sozanko uh, asks, if we keep uh, let wisdom moment go like the flash in the sky, how we accumulate wisdom we have learned in life? Yes. <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to say is um, trying to 
accumulate wisdom from the past just doesn't work much as I would like it to. You could say, yes, but doesn't my experience count for something? And it does, <clears throat> but my experience counts for what's happening in this moment. What was really good for me to think 20 years ago is not very wise for me today. The more I age, the more I realize I have to keep up to date with where I am in terms of my age and my abilities right now. What I was like 20, 40 years ago, it doesn't work anymore. I can't do those things. That's why I said past wisdom is not very helpful. So I might ask you, I don't know, if maybe we shouldn't be trying to pile up wisdom. We should be trying to live it. We should be trying to experience it every moment when it's appropriate and when it's really dealing with what's happening to me right now. So I'm afraid it, I don't believe anymore in the bank account. <laughs> I can keep depositing in my bank account and after a while I'm going to have a really nice balance of wisdom. I suspect that that's the poisonous and toxic kind. I'll feel proud. Look at my bank account of wisdom. Whoa, I got a lot more wisdom than most people. When we take that kind of turn to, to, to make wisdom into something and to accumulate and we forget to live it. I think that's when it, it turns toxic. Thank you, Luke. Next question uh, from Steve. We are so often being taught that wisdom evolved from acting moral, practicing meditation. Can you comment on this teaching? Well, to know things as they really are, sometimes it really helps to meditate. That is, you clear your mind of a lot of the chatter. You, you focus on what's really happening. But if, if, you, if the meditation takes me away from my life, so to speak, then there would be a question about whether or not it's giving me the ability to live life with wisdom. I think that, that for me, the, the issue is, yes, I want to do right, But I have to recognize, as the Buddhists say, there is no action which in and of itself is guaranteed to be always good. No matter what action it is, it can turn toxic. I can give to the needy and I can begin to feel superior to them. And I can begin to feel really good about myself because I'm doing it. Then the giving has turned toxic. So how can we have a situation 
where we recognize that what I really need to do is the right thing right now. Right now. So I'm, I'm doing my best to tell you what I think and what I believe to be the case right now. But I warn you, please don't put it in the bank account. Don't freeze it. You must make it your own. And every single action must be moral. True morality is what I'm doing right now. Not what I did yesterday. I can write all the wonderful or bad things that I have done in life. <laughs> but the real issue is, in a way, what can I do right now? So, yes, meditate, clear the mind, so you can focus on what's happening right now and do acts which do no harm right now. Be aware of what act would really help somebody, not which would make you feel good. What would really help that person? What's really going to help a child, not what will make me feel better. And yet, there's nothing wrong with feeling better. There are times when it's good for me to feel better about myself. I, I tried to ask myself the question, if I could ask an enchanted mirror to tell me about myself, what would be my greatest fear? What would be my greatest worry if I looked at the mirror and said, mirror, mirror on the wall, tell me, what is my life really like? What have I really been like? And I fear it. And my fear is that it would, the answer would be, you could have been so much more if you could have overcome the fears, the angers, you could have been more. I'm, I, that's the one thing I fear the most. What am I to do if I felt I could have done a lot more? But I think now that I'm <clears throat> looking at this, I'm saying, well, do it now. Do it now. Don't sit around crying over, I didn't do as much as I could. Ask myself the question, What's, what's the best thing for me to do right now? That's what's important. That's why I love to talk to my little five-year-old neighbor boy. He shouts from his house in his room when I walk by. And when, when he said to me and to his mother, I'm not finished talking. At that moment, it was really important for me to respond to him.
And I just said, I'm not finished listening. That, that's more important than going back and saying, well, 20 years ago, if you'd just done this and this, you would have been so much more successful. You would have done so much more. You would have helped so many more people. Forget it. <laughs> just forget that. Thank you, Lou. Ask yourself the question of what you're going to do when a five-year-old says something to you. Are you ready to respond? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, from Pasco. Uh, can you please explain sunyata emptiness and tathata sadness? Tathata sadness. Yeah. Those are very hard questions, you know. Emptiness, shunyata, means, in, in my current understanding, it just means that I mistake the nature of things. I just mistake the nature. I think they're really something. It's like I mistook the nature. I have to admit, I mistook the nature of wisdom when I started writing this lecture. <laughs> I'm willing to admit to you. I was off on a wrong track. And that wisdom I was trying to grapple with is empty. There's nothing there. There's just nothing there. Tata -ta is, is a little bit different. It means we use the word thusness. It's just the way things are at this moment. It's just the flow of everything around me. And in this flow of everything happens around me all the time. I have to say that I've changed my mind about the Prajnaparamita Sutra. I used to think that it mainly was trying to teach us about shunyata. I, I've changed. I think it's trying to teach us about tatata, thusness. It's trying to teach us what is it that is myself and everybody else around me and the world and the universe and everything what is it what am i what's happening and i'm just a part of it that's why it's so hard to to see it's it's both it's myself and everything else and it's happening with rapid speed and somehow I have to learn how to ride it, go with it. Thank you. That's the best exact explanation. That's I, best I can do. Thank you. And next question from Singh. When we learn about Buddha's teaching, we know the wisdom in principle. However, we don't experience it. How do we realize this insight? Well, the, the texts tell us the minute you say to yourself, I am now approaching wisdom, you're not. If you say, now I'm about to do something good, you're not. The minute I express that it is something outside of myself and is happening out there, that's not it. 
So the Buddha says, anybody who says, I am a bodhisattva, they're not. And why aren't they? Because they have a, somehow separated themselves from thusness, separated themselves from everybody else. They've looked at their bank account of wisdom and said, I'm, I'm really something, I'm a bodhisattva. I remember when the Vietnamese monk burned himself and he just sat there and held his mudra and didn't scream or fall over. And when I asked uh, a really highly developed person that I knew, why didn't, why didn't he? What did he have? And he said, he never once thought, I am on fire. If he had thought, I am on fire, he would have been consumed with agony. So we have to learn somehow to live without saying, I am or this is what's happening to me. Now, look at me, I'm, I'm running, I'm, I'm walking, I'm eating. <laughs> Thinking about it is different than doing it. I love, I, I admit to you, I love popsicles. And so once a day I treat myself to a chocolate covered popsicle. But I have to stop myself from saying, I'm eating my popsicle and just sit there and eat it, enjoy it. <laughs> and not sit there thinking, Ooh, now I've got a popsicle. Look at this, I'm eating a popsicle because there's no flavor in my thought. I am eating a popsicle. When I was young, I before I learned to swim, I went to a swimming pool and I, I did everything that I, I was like six years old. I dabbled my feet in the water and I was, I did all of this and I waded in, in a little bit of it. And then as I was walking along the pool, I slipped and I fell in the deep end and I sank into the water. And I floated up to the top and nobody had seen me and I sank again. Finally, somebody spotted and pulled me out. But in that moment, I, I think I began to realize dabbling my feet in the water and thinking about swimming is very different from just being in underwater. Having that experience. I wasn't frightened by it. And I very soon learned to swim and loved it. But I had to just, in a sense, be thrown into the water and not keep thinking about it. Same way when I learned to ride a bicycle, I was determined to hold that bicycle up. My hands gripped the handlebars so tight that you couldn't have squeezed, gotten them loose. I was determined to hold it up and of course, it never would work. It only works when you, when you go with it, when it's easy, when you let go in a sense of, look at me, I'm trying to ride a bicycle.
Thank you. Thank you. So we have two more questions. Uh, next one. Is meditation the only way to realize wisdom? Any other way to sharpen our wisdom? From Chia Moon. I, I want to say the basis for wisdom we already have. We have it. There's, there's not anything you need to do to get that wisdom or that basis. I have it. I have it. It's like saying, how in the world can I get uh, the strength to walk? How could that little bird learn to fly? <laughs> Everything that was needed for flight was there. The basis for flight was in the bird already. And when the bird finally jumps off the nest and spreads its wings, it can do it. So I worry a little bit about the question and I don't want to make light of the question. Um, I don't think wisdom has to be sharpened to be truthful. Wisdom is wisdom. But if wisdom is only a momentary thing, then if I want to sharpen it, it would be like when I grasp the hold of the lightning bolt. By the time I grasp wisdom that I'm going to sharpen, it's already gone. That moment of wisdom, that moment of insight happens at that moment and that moment only. But the basis for having it is in me. I already have it. I have the basis. I got all, I've got everything that's needed. I don't need to add something to myself. I don't think that wisdom comes from outside. I think it arises within us because we have the basis for it already. Now you could say, how can I use this basis? That's another matter. That's another matter. How can I be so aware of what's happening that I can make that basis become real? So that's why I say it has to be small. It, it sometimes it, it has to be, and sometimes it's just, just a personal, personal wisdom. When you get up in the morning and you have your first thought, that can be your wisest moment. So that's why I, I, I think that um, wisdom is in a way a gift. It's been given to us and the compassion that arises from wisdom, it's a gift. It just comes. I don't know why I have compassion. When I talk to my little five-year-old neighbor, why do I, I feel compassion for him? It just comes. 
the basis is there. Can I let myself feel it is a big issue. And when I feel it, can I let it go at the same time? And I don't put pressure on him. Okay, last question. I, I, last I'll, yeah. I'll last question uh, from Richard. Can wisdom acquired be lost due to mental illness? I believe that they're almost identical. We have within us the basis for so-called Buddha nature. It's there just like wisdom, the basis is there. So how, how do you allow it to express itself? And it's not as I tried to do, I'm going to wrestle with it and make it come into existence. <laughs> It's the opposite. I have to let it happen. I have to learn to trust myself enough to say, let compassion happen. Just let it happen. Let, let, let the wise thought, let it happen. Don't be afraid of it. Don't try to suppress it. So that's why I've entitled this lecture, and I'll stop with this. So I've entitled this lecture series, Living Buddhism. It's in the living that Buddhism is expressed, in my view, as with all religion. It's in the living it's in the act, moment by moment. That, that's where it happens. It doesn't happen in a temple. It doesn't happen in front of an altar. I mean, it can, but it can happen just as much out on the street. It's living. Our karma is to live. Our karma is to live. Thank you very much for your attention, for your questions. Thank you, Lou. Uh, I, before we end our session, uh, I want to invite Dr. Nadia Simon, the enrollment coordinator of University of West, to say a few words and she has exciting uh, updates. Yes, please. Not good yet. evening. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, I think you guys can hear me, right? Uh, yes, I am the enrollment coordinator at the University of the West. And then something that I would like to share, and perhaps you can share along the side with your community, friends, or even for yourselves. Uh, I would like to present to you very quick, if you can give me a couple minutes about our university, who we are, what we do offer, and perhaps it's a great opportunity for you all. So uh, give me a second, I'll share my screen and... Perfect, so as you know, our university, uh, U.S. creates an inclusive community with all our students across the, across the globe. Whereas, as you know, we're a private nonprofit uh, university, which we have lots of uh, great scholarships that you can uh, benefit from it. And then uh, basically we, our, um, since maybe some of you don't know what we are located, we are basically about 20 minutes uh, from downtown LA. Uh, our student body represent 28 countries, which is, brings diversity into our community. And then uh, we do have, you know, as I said, 28 different countries that our students come from. Uh, for those international <laughs> students, in, if you are 
overseas, we help you throughout the way, how even though uh, throughout the application process with the uh, student visas and everything throughout the uh, admission. So feel free to reach us out if you have any questions or if you have uh, any friends who are interested perhaps to pursue their education. Uh, something, one of the main facts about our university, we provide uh, pretty much um, the one-on-one -on -one attention to our students, we have the one to 10 is the faculty to a student ratio. And the main values that we have at our university are character, compassion, and community. So uh, a little bit about uh, our programs that we, we do have. We, do, uh, we have undergraduate, we have a graduate programs, and uh, including the, uh, doctor, uh, the doctoral programs. And uh, we do have different resources for our students that are perhaps one of those are the dorms, the residential halls. We have the different uh, student accommodations. Uh, we do have great facilities that uh, you can belong to our, uh, that can, you can benefit from our university. And we have a great community. So the most important thing that I consider myself, I think you are known as a number in the university. So everyone will know our students pretty much since day one. And then we care about you, we care about community. And that this lecture, uh, this lecture actually help us to identify how we can build community wisdom and then to being a practitioner, right? Doing something for our community. So it's, uh, you know, the, the main values and about our universities to helping others to helping others and provide those scholarship opportunities. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have scholarships. Uh, if you have any questions about how can I start my application? I would like to see, I would like to maybe connect with my faculty uh, in the undergrads or grad programs. And then please feel free to reach us out anytime. I'll put in the chat our contact information. You can give us a call. You can send us an email. I will connect with you right away. If you have any questions, feel free to, as I say, let us know immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, once oh. again, thank you, Lou, for an insightful talk. And we look forward to having you again on Tuesday, May 18th at 7 p.m. And topic of next lecture is enlightenment, the distant beacon. I hope you all can join. And also we have another lecture next week, Tuesday, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Dr. Ian Sinclair from you know, Nantian Institute is going to talk about New Art Buddhism. It's one of the uh, interesting topic he will cover. I hope you can join us. And I, at last, I would like to thank President Ta, Dr. Jane Ibo Mura, Dr. Sozan Ko, Christopher Johnson, Venable B. Hong, Venable Srinanda, Hong San, uh, for their support and encouragement. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Stay safe. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.